we got a great edition coming up tonight. Author Doug Vilhard joins us with his new book that just came out, The Golden Age of Red. That's right, we're going back to 1924, one of my favorite eras of football, and talk about the legend Red Grange. The Galloping Ghost story comes up in just a moment with Doug Vilhard. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. Before we get started, if you love the sights and sounds of great American football history, like our show tonight, why don't you subscribe to our podcast and you'll know exactly that every time it comes out on YouTube and your favorite podcast provider. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And welcome to another edition where we have a little bit of an author's corner here. We have an author about a very interesting book on Red Grange, uh, telling the story of Grange in a little bit different light. His name is Doug Vilhard, and he's wrote a book recently on Red. We'll bring him in here right now. Doug, welcome to the Pig Pen. Hey, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. Yeah, definitely will. Doug, why don't you give us the title of your book and where folks can get a copy? Yep. So it's called The Golden Age of Red and a novel of Red Grange, uh, The Galloping Ghost. So The Golden Age of Red, and you can get it pretty much wherever books are sold, but Amazon is great. We've got it in print. We've got it in Kindle. And the audio version is really, really fun. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fun book. I just got done with it here recently, and I appreciate you sending a copy forward so we can have this discussion. And before we get into the book, let's get into a little bit about, about you and maybe tell us, give us sort of the 50 cent tour of Doug Vilhard and how you became to author a book on Red Grange. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm an entrepreneurship professor, actually, at Washington University in, in St. Louis. And, um, and I've written several books about entrepreneurs, so real life entrepreneurs, um, biographical fiction. And, um, and I, I used to own companies and sell companies and buy companies. And I'm, I was um, a little bit successful. So I'm like financially retired, if you will. <laughs> and I teach for fun and, um, and write for fun. But we'll find out in a minute. I do love Red Grange. Absolutely. But he also had America's um, partnered with America's first sports agent. So it was actually the agent that drew me to it. And we'll, and we'll talk about that and how that ties into entrepreneurship as well. OK, so that's sort of you took your background in a, a very public figure that was popular. And uh, that was your connection into And of course, the love for Red Grange and your your I see you you live in the Illinois area, so that sort of probably helps out a little bit too with the alliance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and um I do, I do love in Illinois. I do like the Bears, um, which is relevant too to this story. Um, and I do like Illinois too. So it kind of all tied in, but you know, as we talk about it, we'll learn that he reads more than a player, the the what he did for um the NFL too, and what CC Pyle did is worth talking about as uh, along along with Red's accomplishments. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you sort of do a, a, a twist, you know, a little bit on the story. It's sort of, I mean, how would you describe the genre of the book? It's a sort of, it's like a sort of fictional nonfiction. Is that accurate? The, the, it's bi biographical uh, fiction or historical fiction. But the way okay. I like to think about it is, um, even though it's a book, I like to think about it like you're watching the movie, if you will. Mm -hmm. So this would be as if you're watching the movie of Red Grange. And um, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, it's how I like to be entertained. <laughs> and I think it's a fun way to tell the story. So you'll immerse yourself right off the bat, you know, in the 1920s, right? In the roaring 20s. And I think a lot of nonfiction books do a great job of telling you what happened, like how many yards and what the weather was like and stuff like that. But I, I try to tell you like how it happened and, and have you kind of feel what it would be like to be a young man with so much fame all of a sudden and how you might handle it. So that's, that's how we go about the storytelling in this book. Yeah. You, you do an excellent job of that. And you sort of bring out some of the qualities that, uh, you know, I enjoy and probably most people enjoy about Red Grange. And even though, you know, he lived and was famous a hundred years prior to this modern era, but we sort of think of him as sort of a, a humble guy and you, you bring a lot of his humbleness. And I don't think, I think especially beginning of the story, he doesn't realize 
his his greatness where others recognize it. And I think that's just such a, a cool aspect. And I, I love some of the caricatures that you you do and some of the uh, interactions he has with some of the other characters in the story. Yeah, thanks for saying that. You know what, what Drew, what I, I kind of knew I had a story when I realized we've got what we've got here is a star who doesn't want to be a star, never wanted to be a star, wanted to be behind the scenes. And then in the sports agent, we've got someone who should be behind the scenes, but he would rather be the star <laughs> and out front. And when you put them together, it, it, and it happened in real life, but when you put it together, it made for a really fun story. Yeah, well, we might as well, let's let's reveal, let's let's talk a little about the sports agent. Uh, let's uh, yeah. very, very famous characters. Why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Yeah, so um, his name is C.C. Pyle. And he's considered America's first sports agent, right? He really comes on the scene and publicly, and, and they know he's talking to right ahead of this in 1925. And I'll tell you why in just a, a moment, but he was so powerful. The concept of a sports agent, so powerful in 1925, that sports agents are banned after that from all leagues, all sports until the 1960s. Because because of the power, you know, that that an agent um, uh, wielded in. And what happened was he he was 40 in 1925 and Ren Grange was 20. OK, so they have, you know, 20 year difference. And um, C.C. Powell wanted to be a movie star. And um, he was an actor um, and uh, did other things in Hollywood in the sort of group that he was running with at the time went on to be very successful and he wasn't <laughs> like Charlie Chaplin is one of them that, that he was with early on and he wasn't. So he finds himself in 1925, 40 and kind of washed out. And there's, I love the champagne, Illinois. There's nothing wrong with champagne, Illinois, but he finds himself stuck sort of running a movie theater, silent movie theater in champagne. And then bam, this kid, this kid rises to a level of fame greater than Babe Ruth sort of right under his nose and you know and he had seen before the path of other actors and in, in such make it he didn't and anyway he saw a path at the time so you know the world put those two together <laughs> you know at this point where one was on his way up and the other one wished he had been on his way up so they they just they history just kind of crossed paths at the right time for those two yeah, I, I love the way that you took uh, and and Grange was aware of of CC Pyle, you know, prior to them actually meeting. Um, you have Grange frequently going to uh, trying to sneak into the theater. He's paying he's paying his way, but he's sneaking in the side door from the, the manager and uh, yeah, sit sitting in the back. Show. Doesn't want anybody to see him. Just watch a movie like a normal kid. Yeah. Yeah, because he doesn't want to. He doesn't want, doesn't want the attention, and he knows if he goes through the front doors, you know, people are going to flock around him and everything. So, so I, I love that whole aspect of it. And then, you know, I I always look at CC Pyle and maybe maybe unjustly, but maybe but you sort of bring a different caricature to CC Pyle, and it's sort of he's sort of a, a smooth operator in your as a character in your book, and he sort of he knows what he wants to be have red grange you know, be on red grange's uh, coattails and make some money off them but he sort of schmoozes them and does some some clever things to make red grange want him and uh, it's a very really interesting relationship especially in the beginning yeah that that's right and he so you know i think you may you may disagree but you know i, th I think history kind of vilifies cc Pyle. Mm -hmm. they they make him out as a like fly-by-night guy only interested in money all, all that kind of stuff and i don't know if that's um, not true but he but if you try to have like empathy for him for a moment or they try to we do that in storytelling sometimes have empathy for the villain if you will the villain's trying to do something and the hero keeps getting in the way but mm -hmm. what he what he would argue is that he's actually a champion of the student athlete and that's that's what interests me because with the NIL, the name image likeness debates going on today, this was the original one, although they didn't call it name image likeness, they called it fame. And what CC Powell was saying to Red was, you own your fame. You know, you might be selling out these college stadiums. And by the way, Red paid tuition to go to school. <laughs> there were no there were no scholarships. So CC Powell's argument is you're being exploited 
by by the Big Ten, by Illinois, by the NCAA to sell out these stadiums and make millions of dollars for everybody. And you have to you have to work a summer job so you have enough money to stay alive during the year and pay tuition. It's unfair, right? So that was that was how um, I believe in real life and in the book how he sort of hooked red into you know into doing that and you've seen that before in other movies before they just don't walk right up to a guy and say let's partner you know they whisper in his ear you're being treated badly you're being treated badly you're being treated badly if only you had someone to help you you right if only someone you could trust right so that's that's how we approach it and how and how i believe it happened in real life too now, now i jotted down a line from your book early on and it sort of it captures this and he uh Reds coach, you know, Bob Zupke of, at Illinois, definitely uh, d- did not like professional football. He was sort of on the side of Amos Alonzo Stagg and others that college football is the height of football. Everybody else is just, you know, they're, they're has-beens and you shouldn't make money from playing football. That was their stance back then. It was popular. But you have CeCe Pyle, who knows he wants Red to go into pro football, but like you said, he sort of disguises that uh, – that desire and that, that want. And he says this line, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit where, where CC Pyle's talking to him. He's sort of saying, you know, you got to stay within the Red's talking about staying in the NCA rules and not doing some things that would be make them come down on him at all. Um, he says, stay clear of the NFL. And then it goes on to say, but your name and identity are yours. No rules currently prevent you from making money during doing anything other than being paid to play. You own the fame. And what a, a great uh, a, a l- illustration and foreshadowing of the NIL by you in this book, putting it in the 1924 era of uh, doing it. I thought that was brilliant. And I, I really, that's one of the things that really stood out to me in the book. Yeah, thank you. And um, and the NCAA realized it because what happens is, um, and we can talk about some more, you know, Red's decision to go pro and such like that, but but the endorsements come in and all that. And they realize that he could have actually, Red could have done that while he was a college athlete, like Caitlin Clark mm-hmm. did today. He actually could have. There wasn't actually a rule. There was a rule that you couldn't be paid to p- play professionally, but it was very loose on, on the rest. So the NCAA actually took care of it and shortly after in a bylaw. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you know, and that's what it, that's what it was challenged in court recently so it was they 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 watched this and they were worried about it but you know the other reason all those coaches didn't like the pros um was the fact that um there wasn't there is now something called actually it's still in the books today it's very important it's very important rule it's the only rule that actually allows college and pro to coexist it's called the red grange rule actually and it wasn't in place at the moment and what what so what they were worried about was that a kid would have a really big game on a Saturday and then he'd be tempted to to go pro on Sunday. Just just leave college right in the middle of the season and go. And that's what they were most worried about. And then they ended up a year later after after he, he left, they put the Red Grange rule in place, which still holds today, which basically says if you start playing a college season, you're not allowed to be in the pros that same season so it has to swing around a calendar year before you can be a pro and Bob Zupke really pushed for that and then and then they all got comfortable then they got comfortable with it they just didn't want to be the minor league system you know for for the NFL and remember you know in the minor leagues you can pull somebody up to the pros right whenever you want they didn't want to be like that so that's part of why they hated it (laughs) at the time um, and, and also they were making so much money, the schools yeah. were and everything that, you know, they, they were worried, no, no offense to college baseball today, no offense, but mm-hmm. they didn't want to be that, you know, they didn't want right. to be right. that they wanted to be really no offense to college baseball, but they wanted to really draw big crowds and be really relevant. So that's what they were worried about. And, and they were, and you bring that up in the book too. And, you know, they're, they're putting 60, you know, 50, 60,000 people in the stands at games regularly during the season, you know, a handful of games each year where the NFL is lucky they're getting like 4,000 as a big game for the NFL at that that big time. Game. Yeah, yeah, big game. And if we, if we go back to CC Powell for a second, that's the thing is George Hallis, the Bears owner, 
you know, routinely paying nothing wrong with it, but routinely paying people fifty dollars, playing players fifty dollars a game, fifty five zero mm-hmm. to play, and they all had other jobs. And even George Hallis, the owner of the Bears, had another job too. You know, there wasn't a lot of money, but with Red, you know, Hallis was willing willing to pay five hundred dollars a game. And I think Red would have taken it probably on his own. The average, like normal salary was 2000 a year. So, right. So that would have been a lot of money. But CC Powell was there to say, wait a second, $500 a game is a place to start. But like you said, you're only drawing three to 4,000. Red will draw 60,000. Here's our offer. Half, half the gate. We'll split it. And just to put that, that in perspective. Okay. So Callis is wanting to do that in the 1920s. The first paid player in 1892, Pudge Heffelfinger, got $500 for one game. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so sort yeah. of digress the pay of players, that digress, digress this pro football right. advanced. Yeah, that's exactly right. So when they negotiate half the gate for Red, there was a game, there's a game where they played in New York City um, where, um, half, where Red got half the gate, which was actually more than Babe Ruth got all year. And Babe Ruth was in the stands after watching. <laughs> too so i mean that's why that's why the concept of sports agents were like the you know the leagues were like we got to stop that the, you know the on, on their own this kid can't doesn't know how to negotiate for himself but with um with an agent is too much yeah i i really enjoyed uh you know knowing quite a bit because uh, i like i said i i write and i talk quite a bit about this era of, of football history and i love how you brought in some of the real life characters of the day uh yeah, well, first of all, you had the the Taylorville Carlinville scandal, nineteen twenty one, brought up a couple of times, and then that's what you know Zupke's and and his, his the like of like him are worried about pro, pro football yeah, doing, you know, corrupting Rockney and others. Yeah, I got caught up right. in that. Right, and then you're bringing in Rockney and the Four Horsemen in nineteen twenty four, having a great season. Ernie Nevers and uh, uh, Wildcat Wilson and some of these great players, but you're also bringing in. Grantland Rice, who's writing these two very poetic, famous uh, journalism, journalistic pieces, uh, on basically the same weekend, and one about Grange, one about the Four Horsemen, and naming them, giving them their nicknames that we carry on to this day. We know who people are talking about when they bring those. And you have a scene where during the Chicago Illinois game where. Uh, Walter Camp is sitting next to Grantland Rice and they're having a conversation about some of the things going on in, in football that day. And I just thought that was just such a cool little uh, clip that, that uh, really got uh, ingrained in my mind. I, I loved it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. It was um, it was a lot of fun. And what and the, re- the reason that, that I did it is I wanted to sort of remind the audience that we didn't always have football. And, and even, even in 1924, um, we didn't always have football football and Walter Camp like figured it out I mean it was just it was just um what we call today like kill the man with the ball it started in colleges there'd be a hundred guys on a field they'd like throw a ball out and see what happened right just Mm -hmm. total chaos and it was Walter Camp who really led the way to wait a second let's you know instead of 100 guys in the field let's do 11 (laughs) on the side let's let's have a line of scrimmage um, you know, let's have some order to it. He also got forced to do it by Teddy Roosevelt, you know, in I think around 1904. Or so when Roosevelt's like, if you guys don't add structure to this, we're going to stop it because kids are dying on, you know, college kids are dying on the field. So I wanted to pay sort of homage to that. And then also, I mean, if you go, when you go from chaos to structure, and then right at the end of his life, Red Grange, someone comes mm-hmm. along who really takes the game to another level. I just wanted him to sort of see and recognize, you know, the beauty in, you know, in a, in a great career's work in terms of Walter Camp. So that's why we have that scene in there. Yeah. And it it really is, if you look at it in football history, that 1924, 1925 era, it's, there's a big change. It's a milestone in, in football because really pro football is really not significant till red grange he with his barnstorming tour he really takes pro football saves the nfl in many cases saves the new york giants definitely with the the game they had there at the polo grounds and it's also marked by the death of walter camp at the rules meeting in 1925 which you 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 know store having your story too so which is really 
Cool. So it's really remarkable how you, I liked how you captured the essence of the importance of that era. Yeah, thanks. And um, you know what we consider that era to be, um, the golden age of sports, right? And, right. and the golden age of sports journalism, too, because um, up until World War One, every, everything was about, you know, it was about the war <laughs> and, and that. And then really newspapers only started in the right around that time in the 20s, like devoting 20 percent of the paper to sports that started in that era. It was also an era where we passed some labor laws where you didn't have to work all seven days a week, too. So people had um, this, some disposable income and some days off. So, you know, so the golden age of red is the golden age of a lot of things, if you will, in the, in the roaring 20s. And I, I like that you personally appreciate that era because, you know, obviously I do. I do too. And I, I think so just some amazing innovations took, took place and it was fun to, fun to reference them um, in the book. And one of my favorite things too um, is, uh, and I actually have a kid at Notre Dame. So I'm part, I'm part okay. of that now. <laughs> you know, I wasn't all, I, I'm not against it or anything like that, but I'm like in the thick of it. And they're all, all the kids right now in 2024 are walking around Notre Dame wearing four horsemen shirts. Because really? it's the hundred year anniversary of oh, right, right. too. Yeah. Um, but I get and I and I and I love it and I'm part of it and all that. But I get such a kick out of the fact that um, only three of the four horsemen are all Americans. The fourth is not because get what guess what position he played? Red Grange's mm -hmm. position. So Red Grange actually beat out one of the horsemen. So I, you know, so I just, I just love when you research this stuff and figure it out. It's just all happening at, you know, at the same time. And, and you tell that, that part of, of, you know, you have, I think you have Grantland Rice uh, talking while he's at the army Notre Dame game and saying, you know, thinking to himself, Hey, you know, these four guys are going to be on Walter Camp's all American list. This is going to be the backfield for his list. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, news reports come out while well, he's in the press box of, you know, this Red Grange kid scoring all these touchdowns against uh, fielding Yost Michigan team. So I, I thought that was really, really cool. And I, I believe that that actually was a true event or yeah. pretty, pretty yeah. close to true. Yes. And um, and and, you know, it's also fun, just the way history repeats itself. Um, I was talking to a reporter of Sporting News, a, a very nice piece actually came out about the book in the Sporting News um, um, on October 18th. And, oh, nice. Um, yeah. And um, he said, Doug, I read your book. And he said, I'm covering, um, let me think for a second. He's covering, was covering Ohio State a couple of weeks ago and it was a blowout game. And he's sitting in the press box covering that. And all of a sudden everybody's whispering, whispering, whispering. And he realizes Alabama may be about to lose today and suddenly the whole press box switches gears right from writing about a ohio state blowout to alabama losing and he goes the whole time i was thinking about your book <laughs> and i was thinking about grantland rice trying to write a story about the four horsemen and then bam over the wires because they didn't have wires then over the wires we learned that red grange had what today sports illustrated calls the most unforgettable moment in sports <laughs> happened so anyway history repeated itself just two weeks ago yeah, that's, that's definitely has a great uh, comparison. I'm sure that happened, especially. In, but you know, with our day of having cell phones and you know anything going around in the world is instantly at our fingertips. Just just thinking how those guys would get it in the press box and with the probably ticker tape and everything else going through, just uh, you know, yeah, fascinating. Ticker tape and somebody on the phone with somebody else going, yeah, I can't believe, can't believe this, can't believe this. So it, <laughs> it, yeah, it was like also like the early era of like information traveling quickly. Not not to us, the human, not, not to us. We had to look at it in the paper the next day, but amongst the media, it was traveling pretty quickly. Yeah, and just going back, you know, when you're saying about the newspaper, you know, sort of the sports page coming to, to life then, as somebody that's wrote two books on pre-1925 uh, football, yeah, yeah, it's hard to find football articles if you're going back through old newspapers because they they could be anywhere. It could be in the gossip section to the front page to just about anywhere. So it's it's uh it's not a, a set sports page like we know it today and have grown up with. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's just that's that's when this was happening. And um, Red Grange had a lot to do. Babe Ruth had a lot. Babe Ruth had a lot to do with it, but Red Grange had a lot to do with it. One of the uh, the elements of your book is you connect to the reader. Uh, well, you connected to this reader, and probably some of our listeners can connect this too. You had a, a scene where 
Garland uh, Grange, Red's younger brother, and he are delivering ice um, for for company. That's what they did in the off season. That's how they built up their you know great athleticism. But they pull into a neighborhood of unfortunate kids, and something special happens, and you really connect. It. If you could maybe share that scene with us. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so. You know, Red talked a lot about in interviews, uh, you know, he played in high school. Of course, he was a very good high school player, the best college player ever, in my opinion, you know, and and a uh, Hall of Fame NFL player. But he found he found the love of the game from the research that I did in a sort of an empty sand lot, if you will, in Wheaton, Illinois. And Red, uh, Wheaton, Illinois is just outside Chicago. And Red's, Red's family was not very wealthy uh, at, at all, very working class. His dad was a lumberjack. His mom died. His dad was a lumberjack. And then his dad became the city jailer. And it, the great story is that his dad was so big. They said they didn't even lie lock the there's no reason to even lock the door <laughs> of the jail. You're like not you're not gonna mess with him with him. But it left so without a mom and such like that, it left those two brothers kind of walk around the neighborhood, if you will. And they had the most fun, you know, what what's this what's described as the black part of town you know, at the, at the time. And those were the kids that they played with did not care about color, anything like that. Or, you know, Red talked a lot about that during his life. He just wanted to, just want to play football with kids that could challenge him. And yeah, they played, they didn't know how it worked. They had no idea how it worked. There's no television to watch football. The um, you really don't even understand the rules unless you went to college, which very few people did. That was another thing that kind of hurt the pro football. The blog people looked at pro football just like they did professional wrestling they were just looking for blood they didn't even understand the rules there's still people today that watch the game and do not understand the rules but what red did with his brother growing up was play what we did it today we called you know uh kill the man with the ball basically somebody had a tattered ball they'd roll it out you know they'd fight like heck to get the ball and then fight like heck to keep it <laughs> until somebody took it away from him so that's that's how he, you know, that's how he developed sort of his love for the game. That's how he learned to run fast. <laughs> You're going to get mm -hmm. killed if you don't run fast. That's how he learned to juke left and right. And, you know, that, that was his youth growing up. And I, and I'm no Red Grange and neither, neither are you, but I, I bet <laughs> that's how we played too. When we were right. kids, you, know, you just uh, don't know any better way to do it than that. And, you know, obviously that's what um, Walter Camp cleaned up. <laughs> you know for us but little, that's what little kids do and if you come to thanksgiving at my house and we've got a gazillion little kids unless an adult goes out there and organizes the game on their own that's what they'll do they'll they'll play kill the man with the ball yeah that's well that's the recognizable thing of football is somebody tackling somebody with the ball so that's uh... That's all they knew. Natural yeah. element. Right. right. And, and that's great fun, fun doing fun. that too. It's fun too, especially when you're, you know, and you can't really hurt yourself, at, you know, seriously at that age. Too. Especially if you're not the one with the ball. It's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, which I was rarely, not, I rarely had the ball. So I got to tackle people. Yeah. And I, I love that how you, you had that scene as when they're children playing the game, with those folks, and then they come back in the ice truck and they, they're having sort of a squabble themselves and they sort of resolve it with, again, the kids from the neighborhood of that that era. And I thought that was that was brilliant uh, the way you put that in there. And yeah, you know, thanks. I I think that um, I I wanted to show that even when you're playing at a at a serious level, a serious level, if if you call a timeout for just a second, it's still a game. It's it's still a game, and I and and I wanted them to kind of um, revert back to their youth like that. And I wanted to show I have a brother. Um, people in my neighborhood used to really enjoy watching my brother and I fight, <laughs> which is, which is very like, it's funny when siblings go at it, they actually, it's a really a lot worse <laughs> than right, when two right. other people go, go at it. And red had red told stories of like getting in big fights with, even on the ice truck, even in college, getting in big fights with his brother, like pulling over to the side of the road, duking it out. And then next thing you know, they're back in the cab and they're friends, <laughs> you know, they're friends again. So it was kind of, it was fun to work in a real life scene that Red described um, into the book. Yeah. And you, in part of that scene and you have it through some game uh, situations for Red, you have sort of the, you know, here's this, uh, if I may say almost like a demigod of uh, folks for football, but he's having some serious issues that we're recognizing today of, you know, con probably concussions and some other things during his play. And I, I thought that was great that you brought that up that, you know, this isn't a modern thing. This has always happened. Yes. And um, 
you know that adage like you know how the generations will say men used to be men you know back mm -hmm. back in the day but listen to this so you the way football works is if you come organized football college football pro football if you come out of the game you can't go back in again um until the next half and if you come out of the second half you can't go back in i mean it's based that uh, that's how professional soccer you come out of the game you can't go back mm -hmm. in it's based on that so what so what happens is we have players yes they're getting banged in the head but they're playing offense and defense and another rule at the time is coaches are not allowed to coach during the game no plays they call in no plays in fact they're forced to sit their butt on the bench it's in the rule book sit on the bench, shut your mouth, let the players play. So not only does Red have to play both sides of the ball, he's been taught by Zupke basically to become an assistant coach. He's the offensive and defensive coordinator. So he can't come out of the game. <laughs> he can't come out of the game. He's, he's everything. So yeah, they get knocked in the head. Somebody picks them up, points them back in the right direction, and they keep and they keep going. <laughs> um, and then I learned after I wrote the book, actually, I just learned a couple weeks ago, my wife found it actually in doing some research that um, in 1925, there's a new Hupke, uh, a new Hupke, that's funny, a, a new helmet called the Z the Zupke helmet. Mm -hmm. So so he's so he's actually famous too for at least starting to pay attention to you know to head injuries and such and starting to think about it at the time that that guy's a genius by the way bob zupke absolute absolute genius yeah i i you know we had uh a friend of mine we oz davis and i we had uh orville mulligan sports writer which many of the listeners are familiar with uh, the audio drama in 1924 and we had one of our episodes where our characters went and they went to the same chicago uh uh, Illinois game that that you, you really? talked about in years, so we have them going into almost like a coach's speak, and they they they're in front of uh, Zopke, you know, trying to, with reporters, which I don't know if it really happened, but it was fun because that's what we have today. That's what we're doing. And but your character of uh, Zopke was I I really was entertained by it. You brought in some of his German descent, uh, having read over for dinner with the wife, and you know be, the night before the games, and I, I just thought it was it was, it was great and the interaction all the way through the book of Zopke and and Grange. Yeah. So so listen, I I, Zup, I don't think Zopke gets enough credit. I I I really don't. He had four national championships in 10 years he's a little bitty guy he, he could never never have actually played didn't he never actually play himself at a serious level he's too little and i love those kind of people because they make up for it some other way and he you know he makes up for it in his mind uh in, in designing plays you know he he invented um at at illinois he invented the screen pass he invented the spiral snap you know, basically shotgun, um, the flea flicker, the fake punt. And then because he had all these different plays, he invented the most amazing thing ever, the huddle. Bob Zupke created the huddle so that he actually had a little bit of time so they could figure out what they're doing. And that drove Yost and Stag and all those guys crazy. In fact, in fact, in a derogatory way, they called Zupke Mr. Razzle Dazzle as a derogatory <laughs> term and the reason is all the other teams were doing great with finding the biggest farm kid possible giving him the ball and running up the middle and running up the middle and running up the middle and then Zupke all of a sudden would punt on first down you're like what just happened he'd take a whole different field position punt again they're like what just happened and then fake the punt <laughs> fake the punt do a flea flicker and score so I just, I love, I love him. Uh, you know, the Newt Rockney, totally deserving, but Newt, Ro Newt Rockney died in a plane accident and kind of like Buddy Holly, right? So he became, mm -hmm. in, or Janis Joplin or any of those that died too young. So it really added to his fame. Whereas um, Zupke, unfortunately, had a lot of losing seasons in the 30s <laughs> because he, as the irony is, even though he's the innovator, he refused to adapt what everyone else was doing which was money on the side and paying for paying for people and recruiting you know he just he felt like if you were in illinois and you were an athlete you would want to play for your state he did not <laughs> understand why you would want to go 
somewhere else. So it's, and I also love irony too. I think that's great. But yeah, that, that the irony of the innovator is he didn't innovate off the field in the thirties. And that's, that's why we don't remember him like, like we should. <laughs> Yeah, it's brilliant that you bring that up and you sit there and think about it as we talk about sort of football shifting gears, college football, you know, at first it's an eight, all the powers in the East. And then when you're just after World War One, you have like the California Wonder Teams and more, more of a Western side, you know, sort of the balances. But now you have that shift to the Midwest of the, the four coaches you're talking about who were definitely probably the, the four top guys on four team top teams in the twenties were, you know, those teams, you know, the Notre Dame, Illinois, uh, Michigan, and uh, uh, what was the other one I just missed? Um, we just talked about the <laughs> uh, University of Chicago, Chicago. Yeah. With Amos yeah. Alonzo Stagg. Yeah. So definitely it's, it's, you bringing all those into the mix and you're still talking about, you know, Ernie Nevers out, you know, Stanford and Wildcat yeah. Wilson at Washington. I, I, I love that how you brought that, that history into yeah. the conversations. Yeah. Thanks. I had, I had a lot of fun with the the game where you know all, all happened in real life, but where um, where Bob Zupke scheduled the game against University of Pennsylvania, Red's senior year for one reason only, which was to say um, East Coast football, you're t- you're done. You're you're done. You're not, you know, Yale, Harvard, all that mm-hmm. stuff. You're done. And mm-hmm. what what I didn't do it in the book because it didn't because ha- it didn't happen. But it would have been fun for a Southern team <laughs> to tell the Midwest, hey, you're done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, fo- football is in the South now, if if you will. And that's not totally fair. I'm a Big Ten fan and all those kinds of things. But I think you would have to agree East Coast football is done. And that's where it started. And um, and this was really an era where it started to switch. So we, so we had a lot of fun with that. There was something called, they would always have these, banners that said Penn ruled the east Penn, as in university of pennsylvania ruled the east and basically what what eleanor was saying was who cares <laughs> because because uh midwest is where the action is yeah de- definitely true that's uh it, was, it just brings out some of that history and it shows like even today how you know the sec is the powerhouse one year the big 10 the next year uh, you could go to one of the, you know, the ACC, it, it shifts around and it's whoever's got the the hot game going on and the hot players. That's, uh, you know, who's going to rule football for that, that season yeah. or that. Yeah, I think so. Although if you look at the Northeast, um, uh, I mean, what, who can, can, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if Penn state counts, maybe it does, maybe that's the edge of it, Penn state, Boston college, but it's, it's, you know, it's getting a, it's more difficult <laughs> for the Northeast to win national championships than the South. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Yeah. The Boston yeah. colleges and things like that aren't, uh, they just don't have the the manpower to deal with some of these bigger schools that are yeah. really dominating. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I love, love that aspect of it too. Um, now you had a couple characters in here that I I wanted to ask you about. They pop up throughout, and they're sort of they're a great uh, part of the story. You have a, a couple of young ladies that uh, keep popping up in in Red's life, and is there some some basis of truth on them? Uh, Helen and Polly are who I'm really talking about. Yeah, so um, so I'm going to be a little more vague with this one because because I'd like people to enjoy the story, you okay. know, and me not give all of that away. But um, but I but I will say that um, one of them, one of them is was a figment of my imagination to help move the story along. Um, okay. The other one was very much a real life person in 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 Red's life, and you um, and it takes some extra research to figure that out because they don't talk about it a lot. But but there um, but there there was a love interest in, in real life and, um, and led to a disagreement between them and a public disagreement between them. So we'll save that one for your, for your readers to, to dig, to dig into, but you, um, I, I just, a little business side, you know, 70% of, 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 um, fiction readers are women actually. 
<laughs> and um, and not to be so stereotypical, but to bring them into the story, they they do appreciate uh, those types of relationships. And um, most of the most of the book clubs and well, frankly, I've never been to a book club with a man. Just be honest with you, I don't, I don't know if there's a man in the world in a book club. But most of the women book club will not talk about sports history like we're talking about. They'll talk about the relationships, if you will, and I think that's great actually. So it's my it's my pleasure to talk to that audience too. It makes it it rounds Sounds read out, and I think I think it makes him more human and more real. Um, and I did a lot of research um, on one of those char- on one of those characters uh, to to make it really real. It, it was excellently done, and they're they're very interesting characters. And we'll leave it at that. So uh, um, now you had uh, some other great pieces that you you talk about of the history, and one of them that you alluded to earlier is the connection that you had wanting to write the book with C.C. Pyle. So maybe you give us, you know, you, you uh, what did our build just a little bit on C.C. Pyle and being an entrepreneur? Maybe if you could t- touch on that a little bit. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think what's, what, is is interesting about this is of course red is a human and red is a player and all that but you know he is in he was in the first i'm going to get to cc power one second but red red was in the first class of the nfl hall of fame there were 17 Mm -hmm. of them owner of the bears was in there owner owner of the giants was in there um jim thorpe was in there um um uh, I think Ernie Nevers actually was was yeah, in. most of that that first class for Pro Football Hall of Fame you have mentioned in your books. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Covered the majority of of them. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, majority of them. But Red, I Red wasn't in there for a player. He he was he was a good he was a really good NFL player, but he he'd gotten um, hurt too, and he just wasn't quite the NFL player that he was the college player. But the reason that he's in the NFL and what George Hallis, owner of the Bears, said, he said, no, no one did more for football, college or pro than Red Grange. And what they mean is the way his fame brought money and people and attention to the league. And that and it was Red, but it was really his agent that did this. And I and I think the best analogy and by the way apparently so do others because the recent new york time piece and sports uh sporting news piece going off of what i would what i've been saying here for a month or so that i believe caitlin clark is the best uh best analogy to to red grange today caitlin clark basketball player really famous at the university of iowa right incredibly famous and then she makes a choice she didn't have to she made a choice to go to a league by the way, where they don't get they don't get paid very much, but she made a choice to go to the league, and I, I'm, that league has been WNBA has been around for a while. But I think there's a lot of evidence that she has taken it to a whole new level mm-hmm. in the last year, and that is completely analogous to what Red Grange did. Incredibly famous in college, and made a choice to to go to the NFL and lend his credibility. And look what's happened. Now there's no you know no no bigger league in America obviously than than the than the NFL but it it was it was that that I really wanted to talk about and and CC Pyle you know having a vision for it and you know and and you can Wikipedia read for one second and you'll see something weird on there where he played for the Bears and then he played for the New York Yankees uh, mm-hmm. football team but he didn't just play for the Yankees. It was also him and Pyle who decided, Red, you know, you're not going to be able to play forever, right? You're human. You can't play forever. So how are we going to keep having an income stream? So they decided they were too big for the Bears. They needed their own team. Like, Red, you don't want to be you don't want to be on a team. You want to own the team. And then they said, we're too big for a team. We're too big for the NFL. They started the AFL. They started their own league, right? So imagine if Caitlin Clark, by the way, she had offers from like upstart three on three leagues in Las Vegas and stuff like that. She could, instead of, instead of doing WNBA, she could have just started her own thing and the media would have followed. And that's actually what they did, what they did. And then when they, they didn't quite go the way they wanted, they merged it back with the, with the NFL, but that's no offense to red, but that's not a 22 year old coming up with that. Mm -hmm. That's CC pop. And that's that. And that's, that's what drew me to the story. Yeah, definitely uh, 
some some great characters to to play upon and you, you did a great job of doing that and telling a story that's uh really really timeless and uh like you said it covers a lot of different grounds uh you know love interest uh, football to to the business world so really excited uh for people to get their hands on that so why don't you share with us again the title of the book Doug, yep, and, yep, and yep. Can get it. thanks thanks yeah it's called um the golden age of red um by doug bellhart pretty pretty easy to find on again on um amazon's probably the the easiest golden age of red and um we got print books you know we got digital books but my favorite my favorite is the audio version and and i will for business reasons i'll be a little cc pile too i'll push that because not not as many men read <laughs> as we would like or people read as as we would like but when you listen to this thing the actor does different voices and such like that I, it, it really is like watching the movie and i think and and i and i bring it up not to sell books and or such like that but i bring it up because i think we need to know this story i, th I think we need to understand red grange and um and and not just take for granted all these great sports that we get to watch but really to call a time out for a second ask ourselves where where this came from and i i think the audio book is a fun fun way to do that well doug we really appreciate you you're telling the story in the book and the audio version and uh you know preserving this piece of football history and american history for that and we appreciate you coming on the show today Oh, it was so much fun talking to you and thanks. Thanks for having me.